OTAN Outreach and Technical Assistance Network So hi again, uh, I'm Jennifer, live from San Jose, and I'm welcome to TDLS, my very favorite workshop uh, or conference. And today we're gonna talk about using technology in the citizenship preparation course. Uh, instead of giving you uh, a full like 72 slide presentation of all the different resources, I basically focus this, this more on using technology within the classroom. And our circumstances have changed in Milpitas. I used to teach a live citizenship class, but because of staffing changes, uh, I don't know about your, your part of town, but it's very difficult for us to get teachers. So now I'm teaching citizenship remotely and teaching uh, literacy in the morning and in the evening. So. Uh, so that's really changed uh, changed us. So I had to incorporate some of our best practices from the classroom. Don't necessarily work in distance learning. So we're having we're going to talk a little bit about that. And also, I want to hear from everybody else about how their citizenship program has changed themselves. Uh, I would like to just take a nanosecond to say have everybody uh, introduce themselves. Uh, Gretchen, um, I'm very pleased that you you've joined us. Uh, I really have you you my students and I have really benefited from your scholarship. So thank you so much, Gretchen. So anybody else would like to uh, take an uh, opportunity to say hello. Okay, let's get started. So today we're going to identify the latest citizenship resources in the form of mobile apps videos, websites, online courses, textbooks, and more. By adapting and incorporating these digital resources, participants will be able to implement learning strategies appropriate for citizenship online courses, blended learning, distance learning environments, or directed self-study. So the first thing I would like to see, are you able to see the, the title of the slide? Or is there a black bar there? You are? Uh, we see the USCIS.gov virtual tour. OK, good. One of the very first things that every people need to do when they start a citizenship class is to introduce students and staff to the self-service tools and resources on USCIS.gov. Otherwise, they might be tempted to go off into uh, commercial websites and get their information from the uh, commercial websites as opposed to getting it from the direct source, USCIS.gov. There's three key components that you want to take a look at. You want to take a look at the forms, you want to take a look at the tools, and you want to access that Citizenship Resource Center. So let's talk about the forms. Now the N-400, you can file it online. And you've been, we've been able to do this for a couple of years, but they finally put out a new video specifically about how to create a, U, a USCIS account and to be able to apply the N-400, uh, use the N-400 to apply online, which is really important because I know people still submit paper uh, N-400s online. This was really critical, especially in March 2020, where a lot of people were sending in their N-400s to because there was going to be a fee increase. However, a lot of those paper, those paper applications have been taken and stored in a very, very secure place in the depths of Kansas. And who knows when they will come out. So some people have been waiting for two years. And meanwhile, people who have recently applied are already basically being interviewed. So again, if you do apply online, you're, they're going to be able to track your application that much easier. And they're going to be able, you're going to be able to monitor your case progress that much easier. So 
please take a look at the forms and for, for, uh, consider filing the N-400 online. Also, people who go to lawyers or legal services, they're not going to fill out those, those paper applications. They also will be uh, using the N-400 uh, tool, uh, excuse me, uh, the uh, USCIS online uh, account to submit your application online. So the, the, there is a, a real strong, strong uh, reason to do this. Finally, this also supports work, uh, workplace skills, uh, workplace skills in the fact that you're, use, you're using technology to basically trying to, uh, to get this application in. So you need to basically uh, use your, your, your email. You have to remember your password. You have to nav you have to use a two, two step ver verification process. So again, this is really important for you and for your workplace skills. The second thing that I want to talk about is the tools page. And then on the tools page, there are seven very important tools that basically can help a student uh, monitor their own case. Now I've only identified seven and I put them in alphabetical order. Number one is Ask Emma, and this is their digital assistant. So if you go to the website on the upper right hand corner, usually a digital assistant will pop up and ask you, can I help you? Can I direct you to the correct page? It's it's available in English and also in Spanish. So it's a very, it's a very helpful uh, tool. The more people use it, the better it can basically service people and their questions. So, and Emma, why is it named after Emma? It's named after Emma Lazarus, who wrote the, the uh, poem, The Liberty Enlightening the World, this poem that's on the base of, base of the Statue of Liberty. So she's trying to enlighten people, trying to bring them into to the United States immigration process. There's the case processing times. And what do we mean by the case processing times? You put in the form that you're gonna be using, particularly if you're applying for citizenship, it will be the N-400 and you will be also listing your, the field office that's, that is the closest one to you where you will be probably going for your, your, your interview. So they can give you an approximate time. So for us in San, uh, in San Jose, it's 12.5 months to 18 months. So of course the, the USCIS is working as hard as they can to resolve those, uh, those case backlogs. But uh, again, this is gonna give you an approximate time so you can start planning your, your classes, start planning for your application, start saving money for that application process. The third one I would like to take, talk about is case status online. So if you submit your, your case online or if you submit it by paper and you get your receipt number, you can follow your, the progress of your case online. Is it at uh, the lockbox? Is it in a field office? Is, it, is there a background ch check happening? So again, take a look at that one. There are many excuse me, there's a warning on this. There are many apps out there that claim that they will help you monitor your USCIS case online. Those people are taking your personal information and selling your information. You do not need to hand over your personal information to somebody who can profit from it. They get your information directly from USCIS. E-request, sometimes, this is the, the next one, the fourth uh, tool. E-request is about cases that have exceeded the proper amount of processing time. So for instance, and if I take a look at our field office, they're saying right now we're reviewing applications that were submitted before uh, June two, uh, 2021. If it is, 
outside of that range, if you still have a case, say, for instance, February 2021, that has exceeded the proper amount of time, you can submit a case and see, hey, what is happening? Might be an address, might be a name correction error, but the thing is, is that you do have a way to take a look and uh, to some, uh, flag your case and say, hey, this is taking this is taking a little bit longer. The next one is fee calculator. So this will talk, this will, they're gonna ask you what your form is. So in our case, it's N400. They're gonna ask you for your age because people who are older than I believe 60, uh, 75 do not have to set, submit a biometrics uh, fee, which is $85. So they're gonna tell you the correct fee to send in. Because if you spend, send them too much to be safe, they're not going to give you your money back. Okay, so make sure you send in the proper amount. And you can use a credit card to pay, uh, pay this. You can use a check. You cannot send in cash. The next one is the N-400 early filing calculator. So people can, it, most people submit the N-400 application based on five years of permanent residency, four years, nine months, and one day, you can submit your N-400 application for naturalization. Or if you're married to a U.S. citizen, it's two years and nine months and one day. However, so they're going to they're gonna ask you those, those dates. However, one of the things that happened recently to one of my students, yes, she was a married to American citizen. She had a green card for three years. She lived in the United States for three years. Her husband was a citizen for three years, but they denied her application because her, she was here on a conditional uh, uh, residency. She does not have permanent residency yet. They had not cleared her petition for permanent residency based on her marriage. So she has to come back in five years. Very, very disappointing for her, for the student. And she does not get the refund back for $725. Okay, and uh, the next one is naturalization eligibility tool. And you're gonna see this eligibility to, uh, tool also when you apply online, they're gonna ask you questions like how long have you had your green card or your parents, citizens, et cetera, et cetera. They wanna make sure that you're meeting all the requirements uh, to become a US citizen. Very important. The third thing that you, the third page or the third tab that you really wanna take a look at is the Citizenship Re Resource Center. And in the Citizenship Resource Center, there's two or three elements I really want you to take a look at. So find study materials and resources. So those are usually focused in on the civics, spelling, and, uh, uh, excuse me, civics, vocabulary, reading and writing materials. Also, they have multilingual materials there too. So if you're standing up for the civics, the 100 questions, that's where you're gonna go to. On the other hand, resources for educational uh, programs, that's where you're gonna find the USCIS lesson plans. And I'll show you a, a two examples of that in just a minute. So here, P, uh, programs that are just starting out, they wanna see if they can actually go and, and, and uh, launch a, a citizenship program. They can go here to uh, print out lesson plans, handouts for their students, and also further uh, teaching mat um, material to, to plan the curriculum and also for a teacher education. So take a look at these resource educational pr pr uh, programs. Very, very rich material. I want to show you two examples of this material. Excuse me. Here we have 
a lesson plan. So these are lessons. Uh, this is an example of the handouts for the lesson plans for the Declaration of Independence. This is the beginning level. So on one side, immediately you see, hey, we have the same picture, but there's a lot more space on here. The vocabulary is simpler. The sentences are simpler. And they're focusing on the concept of life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness, and the dates, July 4th, 1776, and again on Independence Day. So that's the beginning level compared to the intermediate level where you have, excuse me, you have the text and then you have the civics questions. So most beginning level uh, uh, PDFs do not have the civics questions in there. They're trying to basically get the, the used to the, the students to be able to learn the vocabulary. And when you get to the intermediate level, that's when they actually st start asking the questions related to the civics questions. In some situations, particularly when I teach on libraries and I have a class where I'm not sure what level of the students I'm gonna have. On one side, I'm gonna have the beginning level and the other side, I'm gonna have an intermediate level. So they can mix and match. So people can be basically on the same page, like a lot of Gretchen's books. Doesn't matter which book you have, you're all on the same page. Now, I wanna to go to the Oath of Allegiance. And on the Oath of Allegiance, they have new, uh, new uh, lesson plans related to the N-400 application, the naturalization. So they have things related to, to uh, family members, addresses, dates, et cetera, et cetera. This one is new from the Oath of Allegiance. And again, they have something that the, the vocabulary for the Oath of Allegiance is very, very difficult. This one you can see is a little bit more graphic oriented. And they're talking about the whole concept of military service and the, the you're promising to bear arms. So again, they're trying to get you to have a uh, create thought, uh, to create uh, almost like a matrix of, of ideas around the whole concept of military service and relating it back to the Oath of Allegiance. Of course, there's reference, that there's very subtle references in here. If you look very deeply to some of the civics questions, and also references to other parts of the N-400. So here's two examples of that. Uh, one minute, please. So anyway, um, so let me continue on. Uh, this one, I'm going on, I'm going to continue the virtual tour. Uh, this is preparing the oath for a virtual tour. So this is from the American, uh, sorry, the natural, no, the National American History Museum in Washington, DC. And they have uh, created a, um, a project with USCIS where they have, they use the resources from the natural, uh, nat from the His American History Museum to create one video for every single one of the USCIS questions, which are really, really great. And they're really, really beautiful. They're slow. They're very clean and really deliver some great content. They also follow up immediately by a quiz related to the civics question. And they always have sorting and sequencing practices. And as this, uh, this website has grown, they've added more and more of these activities. There's also transcripts of all the, of all the, uh, the, um, the videos and word lists, so you can use this material to modify and create these, uh, these activities such as closed listening or pair dictation, or you can use it for uh, students to study this deeper. This is a really great replacement for the M638, which was the quick civics lessons, and students still bring those to, to school after they get their fingerprint appointment, they come back with this little red book and a CD in there, where they're reading about it, but the, the material is so dense. This is an ESL version of the M638 with much cleaner uh, language and much uh, really great uh, graphics. 
also, this is a great way to supplement some of the material that we have in our own uh, citizenship books. And this is also, you can use this as a replacement for maybe you don't have textbooks in your programs, okay? So maybe, or maybe you might have old textbooks. You can use this material at uh, the American, uh, uh, from um, preparing the oath to supplement and deliver really quality content for your U US citizen, uh, your US citizen program. Also, because the graphics are so rich and because the activities are so good, it really gets away from the whole thing about flashcards. So a lot of my students have already memorized the questions before they even come to class. They don't know what they say, but they know what the right answer is. But so what we're trying to do is basically try to get them and actually invest themselves and see themselves in the content that's being presented and the history that's being presented. So now they, instead of, uh, so when I show the videos in class, I stop the video and sometimes I ask the students, hey, we see a picture of the Pacific Ocean here. We see a question, a, a question of the, uh, we see a picture of the, uh, the Atlantic Ocean here. What, what do you see the differences are? It's like, oh, the Pacific Ocean is much bluer. Atlantic Ocean is much, much colder. Okay, it really looks cold. That attaches to Europe. This attaches to Asia. So getting the people to see themselves and being able to describe and actually envision creating that content is really going to help them basically, uh, basically use the content that they learn and the language skills that they learned in during the citizenship process and then have that basically uh, permeate the rest of their lives. I wanna talk about how I'm delivering content in my class. So I used to have a class, uh, we would meet six hours a week. So three hours on Tuesday night, three hour Tuesday and Thursday nights. Uh, we would have approximately 25 students, mixed levels of my class, and you would have to be approximately ESL3 to get into the class. However, right now, here I say I want to learn about citizenship, but I can't come to class. A lot of people do want to come to class, but we are having staffing problems, and there are scheduling problems where our students themselves because a lot of people are still struggling to, uh, to put together a series of jobs to support themselves, support their families. So we're still at a very uh, unsure times and flexibility is key. So I am delivering my, con my class by uh, 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 over the internet right now. How am I doing this? So I'm using my, my uh, uh, blog, USCitizenPod.com, which has been up since about 2007. So every week I, I put together a series of uh, uh, 15 weeks of lessons, uh, five lessons per week, and then they're based on US citizenship in uh, US citizen pod interviews. So I start off with very low level uh, interviews and I go up to things that are almost close to very close to the N400 or questions that will be asked during the citizenship interview. So I really keep the N400, the core of the lessons that I deliver. There's always a video that basically is illustrating what's happening in the video. So either I have students, do, we're doing the practice lesson or something very close to what's happening in that citizenship interview. You have the script of the interview and we also have a supplemental interviews. What, what do I mean by supplemental interviews? I took the USCIS uh, N400 and I broke it down into 30 separate pieces. So I always have a little snippet of one of those interviews that students can practice in an in-depth uh, in in way. We have, uh, we, I have contacts uh, from civics and what do I do, what do I, uh, what am I doing with them? I'm linking to preparing the oath, which I just talked about, and I'm using USCIS uh, PDFs. So the students themselves can basically click that link, 
they're immediately taken to pre, uh, preparing the oath. They watch the videos, they come back, they can read the USCIS PDFs. And I leave that link up for the, the preparing the oath and for the USCIS uh, PDFs approximately a week. Some, uh, I'm, some, I make slight changes every day, but still they don't have to do everything in one day. They can basically be on that website for about 20 minutes to basically get in enough information, come back the next day and get further information. So I want small opportunities to practice every day not a huge, uh, I don't want people to binge uh, citizenship content. I want them to access it every day. And the, uh, if you keep it fresh and you, you put in slight variations, there is a pattern that emerges, emerges and there's opportunities to continue the practice. The next thing is, is that I always pair things up with U.S. Uh, learned uh, citizenship lessons. So when I have to basically show that we're in, a, in, we're in a distance learning environment and I have to show the amount of time my students are engaging with content, I use the, the minutes that they are basically engaged through USA Learns. I can't show the minutes that uh, the I can say that they're on the the blog that 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 simply won't there's no way to capture that information. I can calculate how long that it would take to go through that information. But USA Learns is delivering content in a very systematic, very English English friendly way. So, um, and in fact, if you have one complaint about USA Learns, it's too complete. This is very, very in-depth. Finally, so that, that information from USA Learns is linked with the information that I'm presenting this week. Also, I always have a learn more section where I, uh, where I link up to VOA News, VOA Learning English. They have a great history section that I love to do. And I always have more quizzes that I've written or I have a collection of material, say for instance, this, this month is Women's History Month. So I have a lot of information about Women's History Month that students can go through. And again, it's constantly linking back to USCIS uh, civics questions and the N400 information. And finally, the students that are enrolled in my class at Milpitas Adult School, I meet with them about a half an hour every week on Zoom where I do practice interviews based on what is presented that week. And uh, the students, so I'm not lecturing, I'm basically doing the interviewing based on the material that they learned that week. And they're really, really happy about that. So they feel like I don't have to be sitting in this classroom. I can attend to my adult duties. I'm learning about citizenship and I'm getting really great feedback from my teacher. And I want to talk a little bit more about that. So I want to talk about mock interview videos. So I always record our video, uh, our Zoom sessions. Some people are also meeting on Google, uh, Google Meet. Some people use uh, Flipgrid. Um, I know some people use Jamboard. I'm not exactly sure how they're doing that. Uh, and in Canvas them, themselves. So they're recording their recording sessions and they're basically maintaining it in there. And oh, uh, I meant to say that I have set up a Canvas course, but right now we're, we're still working on, the, on our blog, off our blog. I'm using the progressive series of mock citizenship interviews, again, from the mix and match citizenship interviews, which are four different levels. It starts with level A, which is only 10 questions. Level B is 15 questions. Level C is 20 and then 25. I'm trying to get them to fi figure out what the scope of the N400 app uh, citizenship interview is. And then on the other side of the paper, there would have been a civics quiz. And the reason why I did that is because I would have students of all sorts of uh, of levels, and it was a way to level the practice, the, the, the practice field, whereas the, the lower level students would be doing the 
practicing with the lower material, but they would still be able to engage with the upper level student and they're still getting a citizenship interview experience in approximately five to 10 minutes. So there's enough give and take that's going on. Here, you're not getting students interacting with each other. They're interacting with the teacher, but they're also interacting with their family because sometimes they actually do record themselves with their family and they share it with me. I upload this to a Google Drive or to a YouTube channel. I set everything, oh, excuse me. I organize the videos into folders or for me, I prefer YouTube, I do it in playlists. So each student has a playlist so they can go back and review the material, but everything is set to private or unlisted to preserve their privacy. And when they leave the program, we go through it, we delete the ones that they want to be deleted. They may want to download one or two for them, them themselves. And this is a way that they can basically see their progress. Sometimes they share it with their relatives because they want that they want to be practicing. And it's been a very, very helpful experience. In certain situations, we make a point to record things specifically for my other my other uh, YouTube channel, which has approximately 600 videos. So people can see that, but this is, it's very well groomed that they do not put private information there. But again, it's very, very important to record these interviews because it basically shows progress and it gives them the feedback and a continuous, yes, I'm on the way, we're doing this, this is very important. I want to talk a little bit more about some other video resources that are really important besides USCIS.gov. Um, there we have the ESSA, uh, oh, excuse me one second. You, there's a couple of videos that you really need to check out now on USCIS.gov. They have these quick tips about filing. Basically one minute talking about signing things, talk about sending it to the right a lockbox. These are very important to share with your students, either through uh, uh, in your Canvas course or in your classroom. So showing your students and having them talk about it and describe it is very, very important. ESSA group is, uh, was started by a volunteer in, I think outside of Washington DC. And she has put out some really fine practice interviews and um, and also Pittsburgh Literacy has done an outstanding job uh, posting some of their uh, classroom lectures and uh, about uh, civics and also the N400. So I'm really, really impressed by Pittsburgh Literacy. And I, great, I misspelled my own website, US Citizen Pod. That's my, that's my YouTube channel. And believe me, I do know how to spell US Citizen Pod. So I'm sorry about that. VOA News, uh, VOA Learning English and Listen and Read Along. What's the difference? VOA News is basically, uh, uh, what is that called? It is a project coming out of the State Department to disseminate information all over the world about not only what's happening in the United States, but what's happening in the rest of the world. So if you go to VOA News and you download the, or you basically take a look at the language, uh, language um, uh, button on the very top, you can see a couple things. Number one, you can see that it is, uh, it has, um, VOA Learning English, where people can start not only learning English, but the best way to learn your English is through stories, particularly news stories. So you can go to that, practice some of the, the lessons that they have on there. They have great U.S. history uh, information, great things about Congress, great things about the laws that affect everyday lives. So taking a look at that there as well. VOA News, the parent, uh, the parent uh, company or the parent uh, news site also is really tracking what's happening in the United States. They have a special page for immigration. They have a great new podcast about the Ukrainian crisis. They're taking a look at, uh, any, uh, the, they had great coverage of the election. So taking a look at this and they have things that are very easily accessible and digestible for ESL uh, students. 
Also, they have, uh, when I, I talked about the language, but they have news sources for air, for many, many different languages in Africa and Asia and in Europe and South America. So they can get news from their home countries. And these are uh, filed not by state media, but by, by journalists who have associated with VOA news throughout the world. And they're basically posting information about what's happening in their own countries. So it's really interesting for our, our my own students to see what, what kind of news they're getting out of the state media from their home country versus what kind of information are they getting from their own language media in this country and what VOA is actually saying. So it's very interesting. Getting news from a couple different serious sources has been really interesting. So looking at VOA is really good. Uh, a lot of times I start my class by doing their uh, VOA Learning English, they have one minute videos of what happens in uh, a single day. So they'll put post four very, very short stories about things from different parts of the world. And my students are able to, to identify the, the uh, country, basically describe what they see in the pictures. And it's a really good way to get them to start talking in the very beginning of the class. Another resource that's a long time resource is listen and read along and they take content from VOA and they basically put up the text only, but when the, the word is spoken it's highlighted so it's a transcript and you can basically read along and it really has helped student fluency and they have great stuff in there about citizenship prep material. We have the YouTube websites from the White House, the State, uh, the State Department. Department of Interior has a great uh, video that they post every week. What it's like the week in review from the, the Department of Interior and the State Department does this too. And a new website, or actually it's been a, a long for a while, a while, but this is shareamerica.gov. And they boast very short videos in multiple languages talking about issues directly that happens uh, uh, in uh, representing what's happening in America and the issues uh, particularly uh, in our foreign relationships. So for instance, they had, they're posting videos now about people from the Ukraine talking about some of their experiences. So again, taking a look at not only the video uh, video channel, but also taking a look at the website because they're talking about uh, immigrant experiences and also their, the experiences of America and what we want to share. So it's just really, really interesting. And it's the same global initiative that comes that is the parent to uh, Voice, of, uh, Voice of America and also um, American English at State. So this is a really good content. They're all supporting each other. And again, really needs to be uh, brought into our classrooms. Uh, TED Ed and Crash Course are a little bit too fast for my students. Uh, it's, but it's interesting when the parents share it with their kids because they're basically wanna share their experiences. Like they're taking, they're studying American history or civics in, in citizenship class, but their kids are taking an American history class. So sometimes there's back and forth here ba uh, based on these videos. And the last thing that I wanna talk about video resources, which is not really on YouTube, is We Speak New York, which was a series of videos about the immigrant community in New York. Uh, the first series came out in 2008. Another series came out in 2018 or 19, and they're talking about different things like going to the dentist, uh, health concerns, depression, domestic violence, et cetera, et cetera. Lots of rich PDF content, very, very entertaining. And my students, even from ESL01, all the way up to my ESL6 students, really get a lot out of there. Are there things directly about citizenship? No. But there are things, for instance, when people get in trouble of the law, and it's very difficult to talk about these experiences in the classroom. 
I've shown these videos and then people privately have discussions about them. Very, very helpful. So here we have Joe Biden. He's pushing the civics playlist from USCIS. And what that is, is you have a USCIS officer looking dead into the camera and asking those USCIS questions. So good job, Joe. Social media. Uh, you know your students are on social media. Let's give them a citizenship test so they could basically practice some of their skills. So I've asked my students to basically follow USCIS either in English or in Spanish. And I've also asked them to follow some of their elected officials. So that's how I found out that Ro Khanna, actually our, our, uh, our uh, representative in uh, Silicon Valley has published a new book about digital, uh, digital justice, okay? So, um, so we're, or they're following a specific topic. So a lot of them uh, follow uh, news about what was happening in Hong Kong. Uh, very, there, which people are very concerned about. So we're doing this to basically uh, compare and contrast about social media. So for instance, our representative uh, will look one way in on Instagram versus a, a much more informal Instagram is much more formal on Twitter. So doing the compare and contrast and seeing what does he say, does it actually match up to the headlines that we see in our local uh, papers? There's two series that I really want to talk about. And I think it's really important to talk about uh, one of the responsibilities about citizenship is being an informed citizen. So going and taking a look at the VOA Learning, uh, Learning English News Series, which is a series of six videos that talk about news literacy is very important. And also the iCivics News Literacy Unit and the Newsfeed Defenders game. Citizenship students, a lot of them, most of our students are a little bit too low to play these games, but our upper level students can do it. And it's been very, very educational when they go and play these games or interact with this information and they bring it back to the class and they say, hey, this is what I learned. Or sometimes they play the games with their kids. It's very, very helpful. There's also a really great uh, game from iCivics, which is talking about the rights and responsibilities of citizenship too. So check it out. One more thing about iCivics, they have really good lesson plans that can be adapted for adult education. And also their blog always features a special uh, topic. For instance, I believe, I think this, this month is about women's history, but they've had uh, months about news literacy or voting rights. So again, take a look at iCivics. Next thing, I want to talk about having a scavenger hunt. And I used to do this all the time in my classroom. Unfortunately, I'm not able to do this in um, um, my digital or my distance learning experience right now. However, maybe it'll come up, uh, it'll come up a little bit later. So for instance, I've had so many students like say, teacher, who's my US Senator, my representative, or uh, I need uh, to submit my arrest record with the N-400. These are two very important things. One's related to the test, the other one's related to the interview. And you gotta deliver that content. So for instance, we basically identify the appropriate por portals. So USA.gov has links to all sorts of states and counties and um, the US representatives and the senators. So I basically say, okay, you're gonna, you wanna find your senator? Start there, see if you can find senator, okay? See, now it's easy enough for us. We say go to state senate.gov, but you know, if you tell somebody something, they're not gonna remember it. If you actually act, actually show them the tech tools and you enable the students to use the tech tools in a classroom, they're going to be able to do it and they're going to be able to remember it and pass it on to other students. Also, they're, a, they're probably able to uh, basically converse about this in their own languages and again to reinforce the information. California.gov, they do not have a specific app, but they have a really great portal that looks great on the mobile app. Again, this is going to link to our states and local agencies. 
We have the Causes app, which we, originally was called Countable, and it uh, it uh, tracked our national news and legislation, particularly if you're interested in immigration, uh, seeing what's happening with that, and then also tracks with um, every time one of your legislature votes, or you can basically say, hey, Rokana, I support X, Y, and Z. So this is a way to do that. My city, so it would be my city, San Jose, or my city, or excuse me, my San Jose, or my Milpitas, or San Jose 311, or Milpitas 311, these are information, these are local government or apps that talk about local government agencies so they can connect up. And that's how they would find out, hey, where people would go to get their, uh, to get their police records. Because sometimes people, when they're traveling, particularly uh, my students who are truck drivers, they don't get, they don't get their tickets in, in their cities. They get them out in other cities. Okay, well, how do I find out where I get my arrest record for that? So that's been very, very useful to find, to, to use these, uh, these apps. And also locally next door um, are always monitoring when uh, pol uh, our political, our, or sorry, local issues or when our politicians come in and have town meetings. So the Nextdoor app has been very, very helpful um, to, gain, um, to gain access to different agencies, uh, to gain access to our, uh, our political leaders, very, very important stuff. Okay, so believe it or not, I especially really noticed this during uh, COVID. Uh, Every form is an opportunity and you're thinking, oh my God, do I have to type my name again, you know? So, but if you think about every form or your every encounter, you can basically, you think about this in terms like, okay, this is getting me one step closer to citizenship. It's an opportunity for me to practice my N, the, the N400 part of my citizenship interview. So there's the wallet interview. What do I mean by the wallet? If you open your wallet, the first, first thing that you'll probably see is your driver's license. Well, what information is on there? Name, address, uh, date of birth. Okay, those are three things there are on the, the USCIS, uh, um, the USCIS that you will be asked during your citizenship uh, your interview. You will see your green card. You're going to see things in there that are related to your marriage. You're going to have pictures of your kid. You're going to have money in there. So if you have a dollar, who's the first president? Who's the father of our country, et cetera, et cetera. So you can basically start using your wallet as ways to practice using those documents to basically remind yourself of material that's on the N-400. Medical forms are also really good because a lot of times they're going to be asking about, do you need an accommodation because um, you have problems with hearing or seeing, or you might be you have things related to um, uh, mobility. And also they ask about a lot about family relationships. Did your mother have any uh, history of X, Y, and Z? So again, this is a way that you can start connecting, connecting up to the accommodations and the family portion of the N-400. When I shop online, and I do a lot, <laughs> a lot, you always basically, there's so many things in there about addresses. So again, this is a way to practice the addresses that we need to know for the N-400 uh, uh, interview. Job applications, this is a way for us to talk about employment, gaps in our employment and how we basically financially support ourselves. So this is very, very important. So, and think, think about job applications, very uh, job application also when you go to a medical exam, it, these are kind of gatekeeping uh, uh, interviews where you're basically, they're asking sensitive information. You have to negotiate uh, giving you the correct answer so you, you, your proper needs will be met. And finally, I was thinking about this the other day, airline tickets. Hey, nobody's been traveling recently, okay? So the whole concept of people traveling outside the United States, uh, that question, on, that series of questions on the N-400 is very 
Um, not, not so exciting right this very second. However, every time you do buy an airline ticket or do any traveling, it's a way for you to remember this information. So remember, they're able to ask you the travel about travel in the last five years. So Jennifer? now I'm, yes. Sorry, I just want to give you one heads up. We've got about five minutes left. Okay, and I'm here okay. at the five minute mark. Okay, so <laughs> awesome. I am uh, looking forward to hearing about uh, people uh, reflecting on or how people are re-envisioning their own citizenship program. So this is our, this is the final question for today. And also I do have, um, I have uh, given the link for this presentation and also a resource, um, uh, a resource list with all sorts of goodies on that resource list, that PDF. So that could be dropped in the chat. It's so there any, any question? Oh, and I have some news, personal news. I haven't been posting a lot of new material, but I just was uh, in August, I was contacted for by the people who write the Four Dummies series, the, those big yellow books. So, um, so I just finished writing US Citizenship for Dummies. It's up on, yeah, so it's now available for pre-order on Amazon. So I'm very, very excited about that. So, yay. Um, so that's the one textbook. I can, <laughs> it's not a really a textbook, it's, but it's really going gonna, gonna to be helpful for people who are looking for immigration and basically preparing for that, that um, for uh, citizenship. Gretchen, have you written anything lately? Let me, uh, um, I, I have a couple things that I've come yeah. across that might be useful to people um, sure. listening. Um, I've been tutoring some Syrian uh, families on citizenship mm -hmm. and they, maybe everybody already knows about this site, but it's uh, ameerusa.com. And it's a very clear, uh, you know, review of the hundred questions that has the translations and then a clear practice in English for them that helps them therefore understand what they're, you know, more than just re memorizing. But anyway, it's a very uh, something to check out as a resource for Arab speakers. That's really, really helpful because I think the best resource that I found for Arab speakers is CAIR.org. And they're uh, sponsoring a series of, they spent, uh, so it's um, CAIR? Council, Council of American or Arab, oh, sorry, CAIR. Dot .org. Dot org yeah okay. okay okay and um so that uh so that's a new resource for me and that's up on a, a lot of those resources that i would no more normally be talking about is in that that, that pdf that's just been dropped in to the chat and also casas i just posted or a video to the new CASA citizenship uh, channel. And that one has much more of those kind of resources on there. So I'm showing a lot of different things like that. Anything else besides that one that you wanna share, Gretchen? Oh, uh, no, I think people may already know, but if um, if your school is using ventures, people may not know that in uh, the arcade, which is a free <gasps> online practice site, they have a citizenship section. It yeah. gives practice with the N400 questions and the 100 questions. Okay, so the N400 questions, I, I actually got more. I really I like the ventures. I love ventures, okay? Mm -hmm. But they have more of the stuff that I think is pertinent, more on the lower level, like the, the level one and the level two sections, okay? I see a lot more stuff. And then level three actually has a section in there about citizenship. And U.S., the, the citizenship for the N-400, I think it, I see it more based on the, the pre-N-400, pre-2014 N-400. So some of the really, really gory type of vocabulary is not on there, but what's there is really, really helpful and mm -hmm. it's really good for warm-ups and getting people to start talking and start mm -hmm. manipulating, getting a little bit more grammar. Some people come to English through grammar and it's just really helpful. So mm -hmm. I really like mm -hmm. that. 
Mm -hmm. So again, Cambridge right. Ventures Arcade. Really? Yeah, ca cambridge.org right slash ventures arcade. And it's free. And then you it has practices, you know, very simple practices for all the levels, but then there's a box labeled citizenship. Yeah. And it's only citizenship questions. It's not very, very extensive, but it definitely gives some practice and it's free. You know, you know what's really good is the reading section and the um when the, you do the dictation. There are some words that people can't catch and they really appreciate that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, they really appreciate that. 